So I'm going to move back and forth. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the Radical and the Revolutionary, a conversation between Stacey Klein and Baraka Saleh. Uh, my name is Kariel Klein. I'm the co-producer of Double Edge Theater. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge the past, present, and future existence of indigenous peoples, ones who have been here long before us and will be here long after we are gone. We would specifically like to acknowledge the Nipmuc, Pocumtuck, and Mohican peoples, as well as the Wabanaki Confederacy, and add that this land acknowledgement is an invitation for you to join us in what is an active practice. You can learn more about what you can do to support local indigenous communities on our website or on our partner, Okiteo Cultural Center's website. Some context for this conversation. Stacey and Braca met in 2018 on a panel at Montclair State University called Anger, Appetite, Ambition, Art, which was curated by Baraka and occurred after the performances of Leonora Lamagi La Maestra at Montclair State. This was during my first year working for Double Edge, uh, and I remember that the panel was finishing up and Stacey and I were standing there talking to people as you do as producers and directors. And she, we were about to leave and she said, or, Sorry, she turned to me and said, I need you to wait, I have to go talk to Baraka. So I wasn't here for the next part, but Baraka tells it this way, uh, <laughs> that Stacy came up to her and told her very frankly, you must come to the farm. Uh, Baraka was originally in disbelief at Stacy saying that and had no intention really of coming, but <laughs> magic happens, somehow magic happens. And uh, eventually she found herself on her way here. From the seed in that original conversation and invitation, a professional and personal relationship has blossomed. And they've been sisters ever since, in both vision and practice. And we didn't did not tell her to say that. We <laughs> <laughs> didn't tell her to say that. Um, so when we're listening to this conversation, uh, I like to think about this when I was thinking about what to say to introduce this. Um, I'd like to describe my favorite comic one that I think about all the time. It's sort of how I live my life. Um, imagine two stick figures sitting across from each other at a table. One of them is titled Comfort, and the other is titled Growth. Growth says to Comfort, I just don't think this is working out. <laughs> and these two women aren't interested in comfort. They aren't interested in making the world comfortable. I think that they are in the business, I think and I know they are in the business of transformation. And as I consider them both my mentors, I think that the words radical and revolutionary are an interesting choice for this panel. There's an implication that there's this standard uh, that these, are, these people are deviating from what the standard is with their work. I would urge you to consider as you listen to this conversation that maybe the world that they envision and expect is the reality that we actually should be in. That our norm, which is based in comfort, is keeping us from our growth. And the key to change is through radical and revolutionary action. Ooh. Now, how will today go? You will be handed shortly some pens and papers by Samantha. Um, we encourage you during this conversation, which will be for the next hour and a half, to write down your questions as part of this. Please come in. You can take a seat. Um, there's, feel free to take any seat. Um, we encourage you to write down your questions during this. At right before the end, we'll, we'll have a section for Q&A, and Tamanta will come around again to collect whatever questions you have. And as we will have time, I'll ask them of Brock and Stacey. The Q&A will be another 30 minutes, and then we'll head out to our kitchen uh, to, share a meal, to share a meal with you all. Please note that we have indoor and outdoor seating available for you at your comfort level. Uh, some logistical announcements. We do ask that you turn off your cell phones. Refrain from taking any photos or video. And after this is over, we do ask that while you give us love, you refrain from hugging to prevent the spread of COVID. Um, and with that, stay safe. That might have been the best introduction at least I've ever had. <laughs> Thank you, Cariel. Well, while um, we're passing out cards, I just want to thank Stacy Klein, my sister, the Double Edge Ensemble, the Double Edge staff, 
and all who support Double Edge, including everyone here today, and all who have participated in the anniversary celebrations um, so far this year, uh, including the Double Edge Board and community. And one of the things that often happens in African communities is that we acknowledge our elders. And so I would like th to do that before we get started. Is there anyone in the room? All you have to do is just raise, I won't ask you to stand, but if you'll at least raise your hand. Anyone over 80? Yes. Could we actually applaud? For Thank you. Anyone over 70? Anyone over 60? Now I'm well aware that in some communities, elders are considered um, 50 and above, but as I get older, I consider <laughs> the 50 year olds to be the babies. So if you're 50, just know you're getting there. <laughs> I would also like to acknowledge my sister as an elder and a leader and a visionary as well. Um, and I think what's really critical, um, Cariel already said it, but if you're not aware, it's also in the program. We're here during the period of Double Edge's 40 year anniversary. And I would like to give an applause for that. So I read this statement uh, back in December. Stacy wrote a letter in the Double Edge newsletter. It was called Friends of Double Edge Theater. And I've actually renamed it as the DE Double Edge Creation Story. In other words, their genesis. So I'd actually like to read a little bit of it to start us off, if you don't mind. Wait a minute. I actually have three confessions to make before we start. Number one, I forgot my glasses in Montclair, <laughs> New Jersey. So if, I have, if I'm looking down like that, please forgive me. <laughs> no, but thank you. Oh, are they drugstore? Oh, I'll actually. Thank you, I'll actually take drugstore glasses. <laughs> oh yes, they do, okay. Yeah, okay. So, uh, confession, all right, so now I, we have glasses. <laughs> Maybe you'll be able to, so, and then one other confession, and Stacy may, be, may beat me up afterwards for saying this, but, we both speak publicly a lot. I speak before, I've spoken before thousands of people all over the world, intimate settings, large settings, and for some reason we are both nervous and we don't know why. So we talked about this yesterday. So if there's a bit of nervousness that happens today, just indulge and be patient with us. The third thing that you also may be able to help us with is there's a pesky fly. <laughs> who keeps settling around us. And so if I pick up, if I roll up this piece of paper, you know I am getting ready to kill this damn fly. So that's the third confession. And if he's swarming around you, snatch him. Yes, okay, all right. So, okay, I think I'm good so far with the type, with this type for the glasses, but I may need them for this smaller type. Unbelievable and astonishing are the two words that occur to me when I take a moment to reflect upon our upcoming 40th anniversary and all the roads that we have traveled to get here. In this spirit, I think with gratitude of the people who helped create Double Edge from the first performance of Rights in Boston through the Women's Cycle, Song Trilogy, and the collaborations we encountered throughout our exchanges in Central Europe. The garden cycle and the move to the farm in Ashfield and our visits to Argentina. The beginning of the outdoor spectacles and the Chagall cycle and the flourishing life in this rural village. The farm is now three properties. 
15 buildings, three indoor performances, four now? Four, no. Jesus. <laughs> this was just written in December. <laughs> okay. The farm is now four properties, 15 buildings, three indoor performance venues, and seven outdoor performance sites, and still counting. Fires, stone mosaics, labyrinth, temple by the stream, design house, studio space, generative land, pastures, chickens, goats, gardens, a high tunnel, water, fields, archives. Today, we see the future. In July and August, a response to the Bacchae since 1982, when the first double-edged ensemble did rights, a modern adaptation of Euripides' Bacchae, I have said that actually directing the Bacchae would be the last performance of my career. Little did I anticipate that Double Edge would be 40 years old and what that would look like. So my first question to Stacy is, one of the things that we've talked about is knowing the significance of a moment. And is this really your directing of your last performance and what has brought you to this moment? Okay, well, that sums up while, I, while I'm nervous. <laughs> you hit that nail on the head. Um, well, when I was 25, um, which is when I think I directed rights, okay. um, saying I'm going to do something as my last performance. And I remember saying, but I didn't write this down, that um, five years before I decided I was going to die, I was going to direct <laughs> the, the Bacchae again. <laughs> so um, wow. then I, I think of it, I thought of it more as a moment yes. um, when we came back to it. Um, first, I was called to come back to that material. Um, I think the times in the last five or ten years um, have called me back to investigating women and women's work and women's identity um, and what that means to me today. Mm -hmm. um, and then it seemed also as if we should um, make a circle in our 40th year to, um, to that first period and mm -hmm. see, or maybe a spiral is a better word, oh, and see yes. where, um, where we've landed, but also where we're looking to go to. So I think maybe it it's definitely signifying a transition mm -hmm. um so i think as i grow as i continue to grow i'm looking at what transitions and transformations are rather than making statements that i might have made <laughs> when i was 25 mm -hmm. or 30 or 35. um yeah so i i don't foresee, I'm still going um, with my work, but I think my work is definitely transitioning, and there are things that are ending about my work. Mm -hmm. You said something called you back, and I, I have to pause there, even though this was not my next question, because you, this is gonna maybe scare some people here, but you and I actually do hear voices. <laughs> and not afraid to admit that we hear voices. And that when you say you were called back, can you in any way, and maybe not, if you cannot, it's okay too, can you speak about what you felt called you back? Yes, um, I mean, first I think the outside reality, which is, um, increasingly identifying itself as awful um, has um, called me back and then at a certain point I had to really 
investigate how I was going to call myself inward yeah. um, and look again inside to what I, uh, I needed to explore mm -hmm. and um, my spirit and my refuge and, um, and my group's refuge and our partners. Um, so I think that that transformed from an external, um, which I guess is almost the same as when I was 25, yeah, um, yeah. angry young woman, um, going from the outside and all of that, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, yeah. to um, what is right and what is growth and what is meaning yeah. and what's my spirit and making sure that those things are the alive things yeah. and not the things that I can't do that much about except the work on my self. Yeah. And so I'm just gonna take a poll. How many of you, because I think what's really important about what Stacy is talking about is listening to, some people call it the still small voice, some people call it an internal voice. How many of you feel like you actually hear that voice on a regular basis? Oh, good, already hands up. Oh, good. Good, good, good. I know you do. <laughs> and second part of that question, how many of you feel like you actually respond to it in an authentic and meaningful way? Sometimes, yeah. All right, this is great. Good, good, good. Okay, so then the question that I was actually going, next question I was actually going to ask is you recently did um, completed an international festival, which was both fabulous as well as tore your hair out, <laughs> which is a good thing. That's kind of what directors do, is tear their hair out. I, I would just like to read a statement and then I'm gonna ask you to respond to it from a friend of mine in Toronto, um, Canada. She says, all journeys in art no matter the discipline or genre, are formed, inspired, developed, created from its environmental landscape, geographical location, traditions and histories that shape not only art, but the very core of our human existence. Connecting on a global scale allows for informing and being informed of each other's perspectives and assist in the development and partnership of synergy that brings reciprocal understanding. So I, again, wanna ask you, would you talk about your international journey? And you did just a moment ago talk about how that also has transformed and those encounters has transformed your thinking and your way of working. Um, okay, yes. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with my teacher, um, yes. Rena Maretska. Um, now, most recently, among my ancestors. Um, and I started working with her in 1976 in Poland. Um, I got there on a kind of um, whim um, with a, a competition at my college um, so I didn't really know who she was or anything about her but ended up working with her um, for the last 45 years um, so she was part of Grotowski's Lab Theater and she was a major part of the work that they developed, although um, this fact was has not been so acknowledged um, in the history books, um, even the history of the lab theater, she's acknowledged as a as the only actor, actress who was in all of 
their performances, but not as one of the leading motivators of the work. Um, and recently, because she died, um, her, her books and other people's books, have, journals have been um, read and one of the people that led her work when I, when I was working with her said that um, another actor in the theater named her as one of the leaders of the work and the creators of the work and the person motivating the work among the actors. Mm -hmm. This was really ignored. Um, so that's a long story to say a lot of different things um, that from the beginning, um, I was working with her and two of her colleagues, um, and um, but she and I had a special bond right away, and um, under I understood her training and what she was offering as an ultimate dialogue that wasn't based on words, but was based on mm -hmm. visual, visceral, spiritual, emotional, um, physical um, practice. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had never encountered that. I'd always been told I should just talk <laughs> or memorize scripts or, um, and they could be really interesting scripts, but theater was about talking. Um, that was in the 1970s. So, and if you wanted to do something else, you should do dance theater. Um, so, so this was astonishing to me, and I kept going back to Poland um, and trying to work with her every place else sometimes successfully, and sometimes I have in my journal, one journal says, no, 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 you can't come <laughs> now. Um, so I think that resistance is, is something that can be really, really important. Um, so that was um, a beginning, and also at the same time, um, being in Poland, where my family was from and where most of my family was murdered, um, was also a really um, shocking um, place to be um, from, from all different perspectives. And at that time, um, I wrote something when I first went to Auschwitz, um, and it was basically in all the work I did, um, well, maybe forever, but through, practically speaking, through um, our garden cycle. So, um, so that's the international part had many different complex, um, complex moments because here was a land that had really um, rejected my people and at the same time here was a person that I could identify with um, more than I'd identified with anybody in my lifetime. Um, so it, it went from there. We, we kept in relation when I started Double Edge I started working on training in my way and developing it. Um, Rena kicked me out for a while of working with her for about five years. I wasn't allowed to work with her. Um, and? Okay, you know I have to stop you and say Well, then why. the five years were up, and I went <laughs> to visit her in her house in Wrocław, and she said, when I walked in the door, she was standing on her head, <laughs> and I stood on my head because I didn't know what else to do, and I'd never been to her house, and then after we finished that, she said, so you understand? And I just said, yes. <laughs> I mean, 
<laughs> sure. <laughs> so, so things don't always go in a straight line. Right. Including this conversation. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So do you know now why you were standing on your head or you've never figured it out? Yeah, I know that one thing was that she knew I needed to find my own work. Oh, yes, um, yes. And I was just beginning my directing career and that was in 1985. Um, and she had been to Double Edge and she had been in the new mm. space that we got and she saw that I was finding my way yeah. and I think I was um, definitely independently finding my way in her work when mm. I went to Sardinia and worked with her. Okay. And, I was doing my thing, and she was like, this is my thing. You go find <laughs> your, your thing, thing, and then we'll get back together. Um, Good for her. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that taught me a lot. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. Because it's not always the time. You yeah. might love somebody, and they might be your person, but it might not be the time. Yeah. yeah. And that's been relearned over and over. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's even true of, you know, as we talked about in terms of being elders, mentoring others. You n literally knowing when to like hold on to folks and when they're not ready, as you said, as well as kicking them out of the nest and saying, okay, it's time for you to go and spread wings and fly. And so that's a really smart person who knows when that time is right. And not only smart, but also courageous. Yes. Because I was uh, an important person for her. It mm -hmm. took a lot for her to do that. And I, I really admire that and wish sometimes that I had that much strength. Well. In that way. Yes. In that w particular way. And I mean, I may not know you as well as you knew her, but I think you do have that strength. Um, you said something that I didn't, I mean, I've only known you four years, but we talk a lot, and so there's, I, I, I think I know a lot about you, but certainly not everything over the course of your life. But I did not know that your family was from Poland and that they had, um, you know, um, suffered the horrors of the Holocaust, and this is actually I don't know why this is the first time I'm hearing this, but it's, yeah, exactly. You know, how well do you know someone? And so actually that's um, a perfect segue, if you don't mind, into what was actually my next thought or question, some of the things that you and I talked about. You know, there's a lot of talk now, I'm sure you've all heard it, about critical race theory. I know, everybody groan at the same time. <laughs> and what I don't understand is why we're not talking about critical race history, which seems just like, how hard is it to make it to that transition from, no, this is not theory, this is history. And you and I have talked about the fact, and I'll actually read some of the notes that we made, the fact that dates, times, people's places are most often considered the defining circumstances of an event. But what we want to acknowledge, what Stacy and I want to acknowledge, is the relevance of oral histories, storytelling, and our memories. And that memory is also history. Memory is, like you just said, experiencing and messaging, presence and process, legend and mythology. So would you, again, you know, you, you even said how um, your mentor led you to an experiential practice, not just some kind of rigid, formal structure. So would you talk about also how you think of memory as history? 
Yeah, I think history in our culture of the United States is um, fact telling um, and facts can only be told from, I mean, are mostly told from mm -hmm. the victors of those facts. Um, victors, so, colonizers, conquerors, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so even if, if something's mentioned, it's mentioned as between this state and this state, this happened. Um, and we don't um, embody that history with what actually happened, what the, the trauma, the feelings, yes, yes, the, yeah. um, the identities yeah. of people, the, um, the spirit, the loss of spirit, the loss of culture, the loss of um, the loss of identity. Um, so it's a practice generally, history is a practice of assimilation. Yes. Um, it's like everybody is the same and these are the facts we share. Yes. Um, and memory is, um, is, are all the different colors of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that includes a lot of different things, not just the things I listed. Yeah. Um, so um, the story, the process of things that happen, I think is ultimately what's important and what's really missing. And I was talking about um, Passover with Carlos the other day about how each year on Passover, we have to talk about what happened thousands of year, five thousand year, years ago, um, to to my people, and um, it reminds me to really feel that, understand that, understand what happened, understand where I even am today. Yeah. Um, but we don't have a practice of that in our in our world. Yeah. Um, so, so nobody really um, feels that history, what's called history. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, a fact doesn't mean anything to anybody. Yeah. Yeah. It could be maybe a tool to mean something, but it's, it's, yeah. it's not going to make people go out and um, feel each other or yeah. have a dialogue with each other. And that's to me what's so odd about this conversation about critical, supposedly critical race theory is, you know, one of the arguments against it, I'm sure you've all heard this, is, well, we don't want the white children in schools to feel bad learning about slavery <laughs> or other issues about race. And I'm like, but that is what the, I mean, you and I talked about it and you just iterated it again. It is the trauma, it is the pain, it is the disappointment and the disillusionment. It is the horror of Holocaust. It is the mindless um, uh, uh, horror of the Middle Passage. It is the trail of tears. That is history. And for people to be able to talk about that is not only to embrace our history, but also to be able to embrace our identity, which you and I have talked about a great Right, deal. which I also don't understand why that's a theory. I mean, yes. it's actually an actuality. <laughs> that's why I said critical race hi history, yeah. not critical race theory. Yeah. Yeah, I don't get it either, so. But we have a, we, we don't really practice or work on memory. Yeah. In, like in school, we're not talking from a memory perspective. We could learn a bunch of things. Yes. Um, yeah, the facts, the dates, the times, the presidents. Yeah. Like, do we have, do people come and talk and share um, storytelling? Yeah. Like that is, I think, left out of 
Yeah. And, uh, and not even do people come and talk, do children themselves. Are right. they allowed to realize that, just like we said about being able to recognize the moment that you are in, children don't get a chance to recognize the moment that they're in. I'm like, if we can't talk about critical history, if we can't talk about what's happened, you know, good, bad, or indifferent, uh, in people's histories. How do children in school identify the moment they're in? How do they identify that we're in the middle of political crisis, that we're in the middle of democracy crisis, that we're in the middle of, and if you don't want to teach that to children, at least be able to have them talk about and write their own stories about what's happening in their families, perhaps, because that is also history. And that rarely happens, not only in, I mean, I don't know, well, that's, um, that's well, a later question. Well, as Cariel said, yes. um, we're a comfort society. Yeah. And we like to sweep things under the rug. Yeah, absolutely. I have more questions, but I'd also like to ask if you have any questions of me. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Wait, let me take some, let me get some water here. <laughs> okay, here. So you came upon this um, frame, which I put in a heart um, here. Um, it says responsibility, colon, yeah. memory, work, spirit, love. Oh. I thought I said memory, work, spirit, history, but all those things equal love in my opinion. Yes. Well, I wrote love <laughs> in my book, so. Now talk about hearing what she wants to hear. She is hearing voices because I wrote down, as we were talking, and I wrote down memory, work, spirit, history. Okay. Okay. Oh, well, so she's hearing voices again. This is my question <laughs> What did you mean um, in framing that like that? Yes. Well, it goes back to even what we were just talking about um, in terms of specifically African, African-American, what I call black history. Um, because I, I believe that there's a community of black people worldwide, for those people who don't know it. Black people don't just come from Africa. There are black people in many countries in India, in the Middle East, et cetera. We don't see them on our television sets. We don't see them in magazines and newspapers. Um, but you know, some of the earliest black people on the planet were the Dravidians, which were the black people of India, or, and still are the black. And unfortunately, in India, they're called untouchables. So, um, but yes, um, so I saying all that to say, Many years ago, during my work at New Jersey Performing Arts Center, I created an international festival called NJPAC World Festival. And it was about doing the research, the work, not just performance, about cultures from around the world, especially diasporic um, cultures, um, whether it was you know, a Jewish diaspora, an African diaspora, a Latinx diaspora. And I named that second festival Memory, Work, and Spirit. Because I feel like for me, just as you're saying, it's not the facts on the piece of paper, it's not necessarily even the books of the li in the library that capture the, the significance of our journey, the trajectory of our uh, journey, whether that's like we said, Holocaust or, or a Middle Passage. But it's the, really the memory, work, and spirit that comes out of the work that we do, the lives that we live, the, even the trauma that we face, the pain that we face. And so for me, those three words capture it. But then when you and I were talking about responsibility yesterday, then I was like, but history, and now love, <laughs> is a key part of that. But would you share with our audience what you were that conversation that we were having about responsibility. And because that to me is also a lead in to, the, to my next question for you. Do you 
kind of recall what we were. I think um, about we were take, talking yeah. about personal responsibility. Yes. That what is our personal responsibility um, may be the starting point of um, of what our responsibility to the society is. Yes. Um, and that the the interior work that you're doing on yourself and taking responsibility actually for actualizing yourself, um, identifying yourself, not allowing yourself to be erased is yes. an important part of responsibility that we can then um, move outward with. Yeah. And I think this is important for me because I'm hearing a lot of people say, I mean, even watching the news this morning, why isn't the government doing something? Why isn't the government doing something? Why isn't the government doing something? Well, I have to say, last year I was honored to be the recipient of the um, 2020 National uh, Freedom, Harriet Tubman Freedom Award. And one of the things I said to Stacy yesterday was, you know, Harriet Tubman did not wait on uh, Link, you know, Abraham Lincoln. She did not wait on the Emancipation Proclamation. She said, no, I am going to free myself. <laughs> and then so, you know, I, I just, of course we need to hold our governments and our elected officials responsible. But it really disturbs me about just what you're saying, that we often don't take responsibility for the things that we can do. Now, I'm probably going to get in trouble for this, so let me think about how I should say this. As a consultant, I work with many clients, and I shared this with, you know, I have a client that lives in a community, I won't say where, that's, um, you know, has uh, uh, surrounding it a park that has, you know, homeless people, drug addicts, et cetera, and but they don't want to talk about it for fear that people will then not be attracted to their arts organization. And, you know, then the first thing that I said to them, especially when they talked about the trash and the litter, and I said, but, well, why don't you organize a group to go and pick up the trash and the litter? So, you know, they are indeed working on that, but when I mentioned it to their board, I'd have to say there's a good ending to this. And that is one of the board members said that she took her two daughters, young daughters, like eight, nine years old, through the park and allowed them to ask questions. And so they asked questions about homelessness. Why, why are these people sleeping in the park, mommy? Or what are these needles on the ground, mommy? Or why is there all this trash on the ground? And she said, the reason why I'm sending you to this organization, to this school, is because these folks did not have the opportunity to go to the a kind of school that you're going to, and they might not be sleeping on this park bench if they had the opportunity that you had. Talk about a lesson in cultural consciousness, a lesson in humility, a lesson in personal responsibility. responsibility. So the daughters themselves suggested that they, that them and mommy go get some garbage bags and clean up the park themselves. Mm -hmm. Not call up City Hall, <laughs> not call up the mayor, but clean up the parks themselves. I think the daughters are seven, eight, nine years old. That's what I mean, certainly, by personal responsibility. We wait on other folks, and especially our government or civic leaders, to figure out what we can figure out on our own. Anything else? Um, do I get another question? Yes. You? OK, good. <laughs> um, so um, you've talked about um, action as something that can be silent. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yes. I think you have a, a quote about that, too. Yes. Well, you know, you know, kind of along the same vein as taking personal responsibility is, again, this idea of listening to your own still, small voice and what it's telling you to do. 
And uh, one of my favorite quotes in life that I've shared with Stacy is a quote from Malcolm X. And Malcolm X said, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, so if you look it up and it's not exactly what I'm saying, uh, forgive me, but it was something like, if you were really a revolutionary, you wouldn't be talking about it. You would be off quietly planning. I see you nodding your head. You've heard this too. If you were really a revolutionary, you wouldn't be talking about it. You'd be off quietly planning somewhere. And I think, you know, as much as I appreciate those of us who have indeed, you know, called ourselves revolutionaries or radicals and marched in streets or protested, prayed, laid our, you know, I was one of those folks who laid my body on uh, airways, you know, when we were protesting South African airways, um, flying in and out of Houston, Texas at the time. But that saying by Malcolm really struck me. And so that's been a great deal of my work. Not the visible, not the brouhaha, but off quietly planning somewhere, which I find to be both, um, as you've said, internal work. And also I find that that internal work almost inevitably manifests in the outer world. And so that's been gratifying for me and the work that I do. And I think the same is true for you as well that that germ, that seed that you called double edge 40 years ago, then actually off quietly planting somewhere, you know, in the wilderness, no less, manifested into reality. Yes, and it's complex, I think, this whole discussion, because yes. um, I don't think this is about not screaming and shouting about things when it's necessary either, oh, yes. it's, or yeah. about making the government accountable or anything. So I don't want that to be misunderstood. Absolutely. Agreed. But I think there is, this grew out of our continual discussion about um, the propensity in our world for people to talk about things instead of act upon things. Yes. Um, so I that could be acting upon things with your voice or it could be acting upon things internally uh, i mean yes. as your own yes. responsibility to yourself and your work your refuge yeah um, but i think that i got the fly now yes okay fly i've got my done getting ready to roll up here <laughs> well oh go ahead so I, I think especially for women, it's important to understand the difference between um, the work that we're doing, which may be um, interior work, yeah. um, and it may be shared interior work with other people, um, et cetera. Um, but we're talking about action yeah. rather than um, just saying you're doing something. Yeah. But you're really. Yeah. And, and I do want to be clear. I'm not saying it's either or. I'm saying it's both and. Mm -hmm. That yeah. there are those who need to march and pray and, like I said, lay their bodies down on whatever they need to lay them down on. But there's also a space for if you need, if you're a person who works in this particular interior kind of way, that let that be okay. Because one of the issues I have, you know, and I was one of those people, I must confess, um, that during the, you know, Malcolm X, uh, you know, this has happened generation after generation among black people. You know, it was pitting Malcolm X against Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King was the pacifist, and, and supposedly Malcolm X was the revolutionary. And supposedly, you know, Malcolm was the real brother, down brother, and um, Martin Luther King was the assimilationist and the integrationist. And, you know, and then it, before that, it was even Du Bose against um, uh, Douglas. Booker T, yes, yes, Booker T. And so I'm like people, it's not either or, it's both and. Whatever strategy, the issue is strategy. What strategy works for you is what you should be doing, absolutely, no question. But it does lead to, again, actually my next thought for actually both of us. Um, when I was actually looking up radical, 
Um, it said advocating or based on thorough or complete political or social change, representing or supporting um, an extreme <laughs> or progressive section of a political party, a person who advocates thorough or complete political or social reform. But going back to our conversation and some of the things we've already said, I believe that radical and revolutionary is also intimate and a deeply personal um, experience. And so one of the things that I'd like us both to talk about is I don't believe you just become radical because you join a political party or you're interested in a social issue. I think we also become radical even sometimes from childhood. And would you talk about any experiences in your childhood that radicalized or revolutionized you? Yeah, I mean, I, I believe that I became radical and finally said that um, just because I didn't even know that. Exactly. This, it wasn't like I marched out and was like, I'm radical now. In fact, when I worked <laughs> with, um, before I went to Poland, I started working with Maxine Klein, no relation. Um, she was the director of Little Flags Theater, um, which was a political theater in Boston. Um, and she had been a Broadway director and then decided the world was terrible and she needed to do something. Mm -hmm. um, so she, um, she was doing that and I, I couldn't, I had to go do my own thing after three years of working with her, even though I really admired what she was doing, especially when we were working um, in the coal mine strikes in Kentucky. Um, that was really important for me, but the whole communist ideology that was then really prevalent was um, I needed something more um, or less didactic. Um, but so that's what I thought was radical. Um, so I was like, I'm, I must not be radical. Um, and it's actually other people who taught me that I was radical because everything that Double Edge did, um, people would be like, that's extreme. Um, your, like, <laughs> the women's cycle was extreme because we were dealing with women, not just women as uh, women in all of women's greatness, um, but um, women as uh, in all of our complexity. Um, and that was really not allowed. Um, that was, caused a lot of fights in the women's community at the time. Mm -hmm. And then it, it went on like that. Everything that Double Edge was doing, even training, was considered extreme. Mm -hmm. well, why are you getting tired? or in, in training, like, or why are you even doing physical work? Or why are you focused on visual, visceral work? Why aren't you, go for it. <laughs> and that's why we do training. <laughs> <laughs> so why um, everything, let's I put it down to one sentence. Mm -hmm. To believe in your dreams Ooh. and to fight for your dreams oh, is extreme in our world. Amen. Um, so I learned that I was radical. Um, that wasn't something I called myself. But lately, um, I think maybe 
when Baraka and I started, and Baraka insisted that we write our bios, not facts, mm -hmm. but with memory. Yeah. Um, and, um, and the word radical kept being in there when we cut everything else. So I was <laughs> like, yes, OK. Now I can claim that. Yeah. Wow, God, I love her. OK, so I was radical, well, revolutionized at a very, very early age. Um, I was born in Detroit, but I, and I was adopted by two um, black parents, African-American parents. Um, but they left Detroit even as I was an infant and moved to rural Michigan. Now I know people say all the, rural Michigan? I was like, oh yes, the, we are not all car factories and <laughs> car dealers. And what was very odd, and I still don't know why, I wish I had asked my parents before they passed away, what were they looking for? Because they moved to an all white community. And when I say all white, I mean all white. There was, now that I recall, uh, one other uh, black family, but they lived about 10, 12 miles away. So I was raised on a 28 acre farm and my revolution came when Dickie Palmer, um, when I was uh, eight, nine years old, first called me a nigga, and I did not know what that was. So my brother and I were at the same elementary school, again, all white children, and I told my brother, and for whatever reason, I figured out this was not a good thing to be called because my brother kicked Dickie Palmer's ass. <laughs> But that wasn't the end of it. Uh, my mother and father got divorced. We left a farm. We moved, even though we were closer in town, it was still very rural. As a matter of fact, the name of our road was called Farm Road, so that gives you an idea. Still all white community. And um, my mother was actually threatened when she was uh, getting ready to move in. We actually had to have a white attorney purchase our um, home and two and a half acres of land. And we got threatened by the neighborhood, but I think because it was a black woman and children that, and no male, no grown up male at that time um, in the household. So we were left alone until I was 18. At 18, Detroit had two riots, for those of you who do not know. The six, 1967 riots that we all hear about, but also 1968, when Martin Luther King was killed, we went through it again. And on the night that Martin Luther King was murdered, our white neighbor set fire to our home and poisoned our family dog. I became radical and revolutionary. For many years, I literally hated white people. I'm gonna say that again. She has heard this and she knows this. I literally hated white people. You cannot imagine the work that I've had to do on myself to overcome that hatred. And it was intense and it was long. I still have to, even this past weekend, dealing with uh, the hotel where I'm staying, whenever I feel like somebody is doing something that doesn't feel exactly right or they're treating me different than other people, that instinct comes right back up. Is this because I'm black? Uh, one of the things that Ebony knows is for many years I became officially <laughs> revolutionary um, in, in, at age 23, 1973, I was at Eastern Michigan University. I saw a sign on the school bulletin board that said, come to a revolutionary black church service. Mm -hmm. And that revolutionary black church service was who? Was it at the Shrine of Shrines of the Black Madonna. Founded in Detroit, Michigan by Reverend Albert Clegg, and he taught us everything. I had never even 
until I was in college, I had only read two books by black people. So all through elementary school, all through high school, I had read two books by black, no, not even by black people, they were about black people. Booker T. Washington, and who was the other one? George Washington Carver. Oh. Those were the only two books in my elementary and high school library. It was in college. And so I went to this revolutionary black church service and it scared me because they were gonna teach nothing is more sacred than the liberation of African people. I sat there in the church service and they started inviting people to join and I sat there thinking, what is my mother gonna say if I join this <laughs> church? And the, and the minister said, don't sit there and think about what your mother is going to say if you join. And I said, if that's not a sign, if that's not hearing a voice, I don't know what is. And so I have been a member ever since. Shrines of the Black Madonna, the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church. It taught me everything, and I mean, it was like the African mystery temples that no longer exist. I learned everything from yoga to martial arts to military strategy to African history and everybody else's history. I had to study religion. I had to study politics. I had to study sociology and psychology. It was an education like no other education I have paid for, that's for sure. So yes, I became radical and revolutionary officially through the Shrine of the Black Madonna, but it began as a child, unfortunately, or fortunately. So we're getting close to that time, and I actually wanna go back to something that you said, which was a perfect segue. It's the last thing on my um, outline. Dreams and declarations of hidden territories and dimensions, and that for you was the Bacchae and um, one of the things that you said, or we said in the mission, vision, values, case statement is Stacy Klein visualizes in dreams and dimensions of hidden territories. Um, so would you talk about um, how you've created your own worlds and you have made your dreams come true. Which is, in my opinion, the most revolutionary act that you can do. Yeah, I mean, I, I've got some, a bunch of different segues, so I'm gonna try to put this together. Okay. Um, I think it's outrageous that you didn't read anything by black people in in your first 20 some yeah. years yeah um and erasure is yeah. outrageous and um that is your story what you described um that's many stories as i found out from our partners yes um, yes that's our society, I think we were talking about that before. Um, that's a lack of memory um, and work on memory and or even a lack of acknowledgement. Yes. Um, it's also a, a false reality that's being created um, and, and that is connected to my present day outrage that um, to believe in your dreams is also erased, um, denied in, in our world. Um, and that people say things like, you're a dreamer or you're, you're a revolutionary or you're political or you, uh, you're just negative, you talk too much about this, but I've been thinking lately about this word reality because it, I don't think I create my own world. I think that I allow worlds that exist to surface. 
Um, and that is my artistic, um, the center of my artistic being. But it also has to do with other things um, because our, our partner, Oki Teo, for instance, mm -hmm. is a reality. Um, it's not a world that we're creating. It's not a world that they're creating. It's a reality. Yes. But that reality has been erased. And instead, we're told that such and such is a reality, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. um, is the news a reality? Um, well, it's not my reality. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not my people's reality, um, all my people. So this um, constant harping on you're not doing things that are, have reality um, over 40 years of, or since 66 years, that's how old I am, <laughs> um, is um, it's a way to have to imprison everybody yeah. um, and make sure because once you start working on your culture, your existence, your dreams, your spirit, yeah. Yeah. and they surface, nothing can stop that. So as soon as you are dismissed and yes. you keep being dismissed yes. and you don't want to work on that anymore because everyone is against you about that, um, that's a loss. Yeah. So we have to really help each other and work on each other's reality. Yeah, amen. This reminds me of the conversation also that we had yesterday when we were talking about responsibility. And again, the work that you and others have done um, regarding Okiteo. You know, one of the things that really is irritating me, and there's a lot of them <laughs> these days, yeah. is this term that has become ubiquitous and in my humble opinion, um, overused and now cliched, and that's social justice, social justice, mm -hmm. social justice. If one more person says social justice to me, I think I will scream. Because now it's just, oh, everybody does social justice. How many times, as I said, I work as a consultant, everybody's grant, everybody's press release, everybody, it says, we are a social justice organization. I say, no, you're not. No, you're not. First of all, social justice should not be a noun and it should not be an adjective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Social justice should be a verb. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I love about Stacy Klein and Double Edge Theater is they do the damn work. Mm -hmm. It's just like I say to Alma, just do the work. Just do the work. So I don't allow any of my clients, I ask them to take social justice out of their vocabulary and I ask them to talk about what it is they actually do, what it is to serve people, whether it is to um, foster you know, their dreams, whether it is a revolutionary idea, whether it's to take people out of their comfort zone, whether it's to live their dreams, all the things that we just talked about, that's real social justice. And even recently, um, in a grant proposal that Double Edge um, wrote, you know, what was really inspiring for me is for them to talk about the work they actually do rather than slinging around some words that have become cliches. And I really, again, I can, yes, can we applaud Double Edge? For it? Thank you. As much as I appreciate even the statement that Cariel read in the beginning, I'm also sick and tired of people reading land acknowledgement statements. Mm. Only because, again, it has become cliche. What are you doing? Now, unless you're Stacy Klein and working with Larry Spotted Crow and others who are uh, building this community around Okiteo, shut up. And Rhonda Anderson, who's right there. Oh, yes, Rhonda. Yes. Rhonda. 
just shut up. <laughs> Tell me what you're doing. Don't read a proclamation to me. That, I mean, as much as I appreciate acknowledgement, as much as I appreciate solidarity, as much as I appreciate um, reinforcement of other people's struggles, come on. If it's only gonna be some words on a piece of paper, that's not it. That's not it. So, Stacy has been kind enough, this is where I may need your glasses, thank you. Has been kind enough to say that I could actually read a poem, if that's okay. And um, actually, I, I could see the sun, did that say 15 or five? Uh, oh, yay, okay, we're doing good. She said that I could read a poem, and this is along the lines of what I shared with you about my childhood, about growing up and how I became radicalized. Um, it's called Colored Country Girl. I was born in Detroit, orphaned, adopted, raised a colored country girl on a chicken farm among fields and forests. Michigan is not all assembly plants and car dealerships. It is apple orchards and cow pastures. Hey, Ro I am so sorry. I have to start over. Are there any people here from Michigan? Oh, yay. What is the nick one of the nicknames of Michigan? There are several, I know, but. Um, I haven't been there in a Oh, okay. All right. So I'll just tell you. Yeah. Who said that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the Wolverine State. Now, they call it all other kinds of things, the Great Late State, as you can imagine, and all that. But when I was growing up, we were called, and it was on our license plates, the Wolverine State. And University of Michigan football team, basketball team are called what? The Wolverines. So it was important for you to know that before. <laughs> And thank you for the glasses. Okay, yay. I was born in Detroit, orphan, adopted, raised a colored country girl on a chicken farm among fields and forests. Michigan is not all assembly plants and car dealerships. It is apple orchards and cow pastures, hay rides and slaughterhouses, log cabins and lone wolves, the stink of skunks and the pierce of porcupine quills. Michigan is survival. Pheasant and quail, rabbit and venison, dandelion greens and stewed tomatoes, canned pickles and peach preserves, hickory nuts and wild raspberries. There was a time when I could outride, outhunt, outshoot any man I knew. But I have also been naive and afraid. I will tell you this if you fuck with me, I will surely turn on you like a Detroit alley girl or a cornered Wolverine. That's my radicalization story. <laughs> okay, what else? You, you wanna just riff? You wanna just? <laughs> I think we can get to some questions. I like that idea. Okay, so you want to collect or have we already collected? Yeah, I have some come around. Okay. Okay, so let's take a few minutes to collect questions. And thank you for. Yeah, <laughs> Yes. And it says, I stand on the sacrifice of a million women before me and think, what can I do to make the mountain taller so the woman after me can see more? Yes. And it's called legacy. Yes. And if both of you are sitting here as radical revolutionary legacy makers, mm -hmm. what are you thinking of as you are, as also two incredible mentors to many people? What are you thinking of as a legacy? And what are you giving? What would be the one gift that you would give to all your mentees? Sorry, I didn't get to go on. It's not a gift, it's just beautiful. 
You're first. Oh. <laughs> Well, two things. Um, one is the thing that Stacy said in the very beginning of what her mentor gave to her. I'm done here. <laughs> you know, go and do your work. And you're going to make mistakes, and you're going to fall flat on your face. And, but the one thing I say is there's no such thing as failure. There's only lessons learned. And lessons learned lead, lead, lead to best practice. There's no such thing as failure. There's only lessons learned, and lessons learned lead to best practice. The second thing I would say is something Gloria Stein, I heard Gloria Steinem say, and that was um, when someone asked her the same kind of question, you know, what legacy do you, are you leaving, and are you worried or concerned that young people, young women these days don't know your name or don't know who you are? And she wisely said, I don't care if they don't know who I am. I just want them to know who they are. Oh, yeah. I was like, and that's the right answer, Gloria. <laughs> yeah. I want them to know who they are. Your turn. I said that, too. Oh. <laughs> OK. Um, I think I want. Um, to say something to the women that I'm mentoring, um, which is um, make sure that your silence is something that you desire rather than something that has been um, thrust upon you. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and keep working on that for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and then the other thing is something that's come up lately at Double Edge, which is this idea when you find your people, um, make sure you work things out with them. Yeah. Because that's not as easy as it sounds. Yeah. Yeah. The only other thing I would add to that is, you know, this whole thing of mentoring. Um, I want to be clear that mentoring is indeed a two-way street. I mean, I've had an opportunity to work with Ebony. I've had a chance to work with Cariel. Um, maybe there's others in the room, I'm not sure. But that I learned so much from you. I learned so much from Cariel. I know you don't always think that, but that is absolutely true. That just because you may be the elder doesn't necessarily mean that you're not simultaneously learning, especially from the, from the men, women and men. Um, just lately, um, maybe when I say lately, like in the past maybe four or five years, um, I've really been focusing on young black men because most of my career and life I've been mentoring women. And a young, a young man at a conference, he said, where are the people mentoring black men? And he actually wanted a woman mentor, not a male mentor. He wanted a woman mentor. And there's, I, I thought it was incredibly powerful for a man to be able to say, I need feminine wisdom as much as I need masculine wisdom. Mm -hmm. So if you're a mentor or a teacher, um, please make sure you are taking young men under your wing. Um, I have a lot of questions. Okay. I just want to find it through. I'm going to turn this way. Um, uh, I'm going to start with um, how do we create memory ritual? <laughs> you get to go first this time. Okay. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I do too. Um, I think that um, we've talked about ritual. Hold on, I'm sorry. Did everybody hear the question? No, no some people didn't hear the question. Uh, sorry, I'll How do we create memory ritual? Yeah, I think we've talked about ritual as um, storytelling, not necessarily word storytelling, but visual or um, 
physical, emotional storytelling um, rather than a script. And I think that memory um, is, is the research of that ritual, which is the action. Memory is the research, and ritual is the action. I'd like to also respond to that. And that is, if you don't already, I have a sense that in some cases we're kind of preaching to the choir here, and that's a good thing, because I always feel like if you are like me, grew up in a church or a black church, the choir are always the people that gets things done. <laughs> so I believe in preaching to the choir. But I kind of think this might be preaching to the choir, but we don't talk about it enough. We need to have spiritual practice in our daily lives. And part of my spiritual practice is daily in my prayers and meditation remembering my ancestors and speaking their names. And so I'm just going to share with you, my mother's name was Claudia May, and my father, who, who uh, both his mother and father were ministers, were na was named Sabbath Emmanuel. I have never, ever again heard a person who was named Sabbath. But I talk to them every day and I say this, I won't give you the, because I have a 30 minute ritual every day. But when I talk to my mother, I say, mother, teach me to be kind, compassionate, thoughtful, considerate, humble, unconceited, caring, patient, kind, loving, forgiving in thought, word, and deed. That's what I say to my mother every single day. So make sure that memory and ritual is also part of your spiritual practice. I think that's a good segue to this question, which is uh, what personal practices of care or ritual do you come to call on to hold close to yourself? I just got done. <laughs> I think you can answer that. Um, so read it again and a little louder also. What personal practices of care do you come to call on to hold close to yourself? Well, as I said, probably. I have been doing uh, meditation and prayer God, I can't even say how many decades now, daily meditation and prayer for many decades. And um, recently, my sister in Houston asked me, I'm, well, the, the first question she asked me years ago, and she said, why do you do daily prayer and meditation? And I said, at that time, because I want God to know my voice. And I said, part of the problem is we call on the angels, the ancestors, and Orishas only when there's a storm coming, when the wind is raging, when the, when the debt collector's at the door. Lord, help me now. That's not the time to call, because he's like, where you, you know, like the old blues song, look for you yesterday, here you come today. <laughs> I want God to know my voice. And let me tell you, I am not saying this. My mother is my witness to brag or boast. God has answered all my prayers. I cannot think of anything that I have not asked the angels, the ancestors, the Orishas, and they have not delivered. I didn't even know I was looking for her. And they sent her. So that to me is really, um, that is really important. Then recently my sister asked, like, okay, you know, I know you've been doing prayer, prayer meditation, you know, all these years, but why do you still continue to do it? And I said, submission. 
submission. You know, I, I don't want to get preachy here, but I will say this right quick. There's something to be said for not my will to be done, thy will be done. I actually created for myself as part of, oh, Ebony knows this because she has received it. I actually created a covenant for myself. God and I have a covenant. And part of that covenant is I will be whoever it is you want me to be. I will do whatever it is you want me to do. I will go wherever it is you want me to go. I will serve whoever it is you want or need me to serve. I only ask that you guide my footsteps on the path you want me to take. Now, I'm not suggesting that you do that. I'm suggesting that is what has worked for me. But that is real in my life, that I make a covenant and I submit to it on a daily basis. OK. <laughs> Does freedom need a plan? And how long do you have to stick to the plan before you get it? <laughs> oh, that's a good question for Stacey. I think everything needs a plan. I don't think that we are random or we're, we can accomplish in a random way. Um, things of value. Um, so uh, I love planning and I have mm -hmm. a, a handwritten calendar which is very full um, and I don't do the Google Cal at double H. <laughs> um, but I, in a more serious way, I think that um, to take action in, in our world is an act of, um, well, extreme revolution, mm -hmm. probably. Mm -hmm. um, so that requires a plan. Otherwise, you'll get killed or you will give up um, and hide. So um, the plan, though, is not necessarily um, one kind of plan or another. I think the plan needs to start with yourself, mm -hmm. what you're doing um, inside yourself, and what you're doing with your people. And um, if you're an artist, how you're conceiving that art, um, practicing that art, or actually whoever you are. Um, starting with yourself and then um, and then you have to account for everything else um, it's it's dangerous it, it's dangerous if you if you go into a room alone well I can give you an example at double edge we don't allow somebody to fly by themselves by fly mm -hmm. in the air here bungees whatever it is because it's dangerous. Because when you're taking a risk, it's, that's physically dangerous. But um, if you're training, that can be emotionally dangerous. So there needs to be partnership and a plan for how you're going to be safe and secure and have a refuge. And if you're, you're coming to this community, there needs to be a plan. Um, because there might be danger in the community. You might think it's a lovely, beautiful community, but there's still things that are happening. So there's always got to be a plan. Um, and can I just add to, I'm very, I don't know how many of you have seen this as a publication Stacy and I wrote together. It's Double Edge's case statement. And the mission, vision, values is actually, of it is actually in your programs. But I, the only thing I want to add is if you're having a hard time figuring out a plan, this is it. It's called who, what, when, where, how, and most important, why. Mm -hmm. When you're making your plan that Stacy talked about, those are the questions that you need to ask yourself.
know who other wrote this card, but they had some very good questions. So I'm going to continue on this oh, part. Okay. Um, what is justice in your words? And what does justice look and feel like? How does it work in this world? <laughs> um, I mean, I think Baraka said what I think. Justice is an action, um, and it's an action, it's a daily action. It's not a, like, we're going to go do justice action. Um, and it, it's part of the plan. It's part I mean, of the plan. it's your everyday um, really thinking about that. That's part of that's part of the dream. You can't have dreams without having justice. Um, so I think justice is an action. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, like I said, I think we've said it. And, and I think what's really important, and it's also, as I said, talked about in this document, as, you, as well as even in your programs, um, what I really liked when I first started working with Stephanie, I mean, with Stephanie, with Stacy, <laughs> is that she's over there. <laughs> <laughs> she's the nice one. <laughs> oh. um, is what it, double edge refers to art justice. And what I really liked that is it seemed very. Um, organization specific. You know, it wasn't just, like I said, the cliched um, things that I was hearing from so many, the adjective, the noun, rather than, no, we're not just doing social justice. We're doing, and what really resonated with me about that is I have been telling people, you know, st this is another one of those cliches, stop using equity, diversity, inclusion. If I hear that again, I think I'll scream. No, it's not equity, diversity, inclusion. What I named those things was cultural democracy, mm -hmm. cultural equity, cultural justice. Mm -hmm. So when I heard her say art justice, because really, to, to be honest, justice in art and culture is actually something different than social justice. Mm -hmm. Now that's another whole conversation that I'm not gonna get into, but justice in art and culture is actually different. You are working on very different things. So, yes, justice has to be specific. And whether that's, you call it art justice, whether you call it personal justice, whether you call it environmental justice, justice applies, should apply to a specific thing and a specific focus of work that you are doing. So returning to the case statement, Baraka, you came in to try like the insurmountable task of trying to encapsulate double edged in words. Yes. And I'm wondering if you can both speak a little bit to the process of working on the case statement um, and how I'm sure it was filled with joy. <laughs> <laughs> The joy was overwhelming, um, <laughs> and then um, do you want to say something? <laughs> Baraka yelled at me a lot. <laughs> Just, the joy was overwhelming, and then it wasn't. <laughs> and then it was. It and was then hard it wasn't. and not yeah. comfortable yeah. work um, because yeah articulating in words something that actually I feel like I was at the point of giving up in terms of like I'm just gonna speak like a grant um, so yeah at that point it was like you know whatever they want me to say yeah and it wasn't yeah. even right because I wasn't saying what they wanted me to say because I don't know what they want me to say. <laughs> Still don't. Um, so I think um, for me there was a hard lesson there which 
I won't give up about um, actually articulating the truth. Um, and I think this has to do with what I said about being silent um, and not trusting that I could say the truth about what I was doing um, and that people would accept that um, at that time. Now um, I learned um, I'm not, that's not really relevant to me anymore. Yeah. yeah. But that was 35 years of thinking yeah. it was relevant. That's yeah. a long time. These 14 pages took a year yeah. for us to do. 14 pages. And it took us a year. Um, it was conversations not only with Stacy, but it was conversations with Cariel, it was conversations with Carlos, it was Car conversations with Jennifer, it was Car conversations with Travis, Travis, I mean, conversations with uh, Hannah, you know, everyone. And sometimes, you know, Adam, you know, I don't think people realized what I was listening to and listening for. Mm -hmm. But I'm always listening, even though I talk a lot, <laughs> I'm always listening. And what they didn't realize is that I wasn't really writing this. They were writing this. I was just listening. And so it was then that I was able to capture the internal. It was things that, you know, like, as she said, you know, when radical kept coming up in the conversation, I'm like, well, that's got to be in here. Radical has to be in here. But nobody ever says in a in a um, in a uh, grant proposal, "I'm a radical." <laughs> if any of you have ever read a grant, what arts organizations that you know say we're radical? <laughs> and it drives me absolutely crazy that these. As much as I appreciate all the foundations that I've worked with, all the foundations that have given me literally millions of dollars, what I cannot tolerate, what I will not tolerate, is that we cannot, as we've all been saying, tell the truth of our stories. Now, do you really want to know who I am, or do you just want me to do grant speak? Because that's what I call it. Grant speak. And so then they wonder, they sit there and wonder, because I've, I've now retired from grant panels. And then they sit there and wonder, why do all the grant applications sound the same? <laughs> they all say diversity, equity, inclusion. They all say social justice. They all say the now. Now. They didn't but be, well, no, before that, let me go, I'm not finished. Yeah. Before that, which I make every client take out of their vocabulary, before that it was, well, we work with the underserved, the underprivileged. We work with the non-white. We work with the, um, it, you know, and it drove me crazy. So I was actually on a panel and I said, they had all the criteria by which they were judging these grant applications. And this is how I came to the philosophy of who, what, when, where, how, and why. The funder was there, the, the what do you call that when you redistribute money? The, the re-granting organization was there. And I said, I'm not using your criteria or the foundation's criteria. My cri criteria is who, what, when, where, how, and why. And every time I don't see it in the grant application, I'm taking off 10 points. Because if you're so-called, if you are so-called serving the underserved, who is that? That doesn't tell me anything. Are you working with youth? Are you working with, and tell me who they are. And some per person said, well, uh, at-risk youth, that's an, that's an identity. I said, no, it isn't. I said, that's a condition. And a condition is not an identity, people. Yeah. So let's start listening to the words we're using. Let's just stop applying the rhetoric and the grant speak that people hand to us, and let's tell our truth, who, what, when, where, how, and especially why. Why are you doing this work? That's what I want to know. If you're so-called working with underserved, are you working? Because most of the time, the why is I just want to get a grant. Mm -hmm. 
And that's what you're funding right now. You're funding underserved people, so let me write a grant about underserved people. No, not acceptable. So, sorry, I kind of got. <laughs> I get off of it. Well, that's what you did say to me. When I <laughs> <laughs> statement and all those words are no longer. In yes, but you. But the difference is between you and so many other folks that I work with is you got it. So then we started really talk about digging down into double-edged reality. And it, I mean, that's where the real joy came from. I was like, look what, and a mighty people came up out of Asheville. <laughs> Whoa. Okay, sorry, Kari. No, um, so I'm gonna ask one last question. Okay. Um, it better be good. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there are a lot of questions. I just want to say I'm trying to keep them to questions that will address both of you. Um, because I think that there will be time for me for people who have specific questions with either one of you. I'm so cute. Okay. Um, but I'd like to end on what do you want to dream into the future? Mm -hmm. oh, that what do you want to dream into the future? Dream. 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 I'm, I'm going to thank um, the partners that um, I and Double Edge work with. Um, Rhonda, is thank, thank you for coming today. Um, Rhonda is the co-director of Okiteo Cultural Center, which I've had the honor of working with in the last three years. Um, that's a big, I feel like crying right now, so oh. hold on a minute. <laughs> That's a big um, dream to go from something which I was told didn't exist to something which has moved all of Ashfield and way beyond that um, in its growth. Um, never seen something grow like that mm, mm. Um, and um, and then I want to thank um, Ebony and her Jupiter Performance Studio um, another major partner of Double Edge and the work that we're doing together which um, we're starting one of our projects together um, today after this um, at, in its second year um, and but there's many projects um, that have come from our partnership um, and residency over the years and really um, w helped greatly to transform Double Edge um, into the place that we want it to be um, in many ways, also as a board member. Um, and, um, and then there's two other partners who do um, residencies, and one is fledgling partner, um, but I'll say it anyway, the Anishinaabe Theater Exchange. Um, and um, the Theater Offensive in Boston, which is an LGBTQ um, people of color um, theater uh, that um, does residencies here. So this is um, what I'm dreaming into the future alongside of the work of the Double Edge Ensemble. Um, which at this point I have the privilege of sharing um, leadership with the ensemble and um, also sharing directing um, responsibilities with the ensemble. Mm -hmm. So this is um, a really um, beginning of my next part of my life, which I'm very excited about. Um, and. So those are the things that I am honored to um, dream into the future. 
um, as well as the village that I'm trying to create in this town, um, which is basically all of those um, partners and Double Edge and anybody else who needs refuge and safe places to create. Yes. So, I don't dream into the future a whole lot. I usually dream in the here and now. And along with what Stacy said, I usually dream in gratitude. I, I'm so appreciative of all of you who came, all of you who are participated, all of you who are engaged in this moment. Um, you know, a lot of times when I'm sitting here, I've been saying to myself, um, even just listening to Stacy, thank you, God, thank you. I say, when I'm, what I tell often uh, to people that I work with or mentor, um, you've heard this, you've heard this, replace fear with gratitude. Replace fear with gratitude. So most of the time I'm meditating to myself, thank you God, thank you. So I'm very grateful for this moment. Um, and so I, I just want to, one of the last, in my last meeting um, with some of the members of the ensemble, I, my words of wisdom is practice radical love. Radical love. You want to talk about what's really revolutionary and radical? Is love. Read, read the, if you don't mind, when you get home, read the poem that um, Stacy allowed and Cariel allowed me to share with you um, in the program, Radical Love. So I'm just gonna say this is my dream. It's called evolution. When we are closest to death, having failed to establish the real meaning of life, when we must abandon the mystery of who we are, will you remember sleeping inside the still black earth and the sun calling us to light, a life not yet dreamed of? Perhaps you awakened as a salmon, salmon or flew off into the darkness like a moon. Some of us became lovers. Practice radical love, that would be my dream. Thank you.